Feels good. Yeah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming along tonight. I was uh, I was parking up my bike. I came a little bit late this evening. I was parking up my bike and I just looked in and saw everyone's happy faces chatting away about, I assume, JavaScript and throwing it away. But it really warmed my heart to see such a, such a great community. So lovely to see everyone. Uh, tonight, we've got Ollie from the Async community doing a talk. We will I will give him a proper intro later, but I'm very excited both to have Ollie here talking and about the actual talk itself. But before that, I have a few points of admin. I I just want to say that it's generally considered bad form for, for the host when they're doing an introduction to read from their phone. I have not memorized anything. Jan sent me some fantastic notes earlier, so I'm going to read from my phone. So I'm really sorry about that. However, Firstly, uh, most importantly, some might say the code of conduct. You all look like wonderful people here. However, if anything happens that makes you feel at all uncomfortable, then please come and talk to one of us that has the purple lanyard. We have a code of conduct. It's at asyncjs.com slash code of conduct, so, uh, hyphenated. Um, so, so please have a look at that when you get the chance. But the TLDR is treat each other as you'd like to be treated yourself. Runway East, where we are at the moment, which is such a gorgeous space every time I come, I'm, I'm very happy. They are sponsoring tonight. Natasha, thank you so much, both for, for your marshalling and for sponsoring the pizza. Did you want to say a few words at all? Yeah, thank you so much. Hi, just a warm welcome. If you haven't been here before, we are Runway East on a mission to destroy boring offices in London, Bristol, and now Brighton. So if you're looking for a new home, we offer everything from a sociable, dedicated work desk to private, customized, and very swanky offices for up to 100 people. And we particularly like to come into contact with SMEs, startups, and entrepreneurs, and recently becoming a B Corps. That's why we host lovely events like this to connect with our community. So if you're looking for a new work home, do Google Runway Runway East Brighton. Thank you. So I, I'm trying to learn the piano at the moment, like coming back into it after some time, and I'm sort of plinking around. And sometimes, like you see a real pianist playing live, and you just <laughs> think, "Oh my word!" And that, that's the feeling I just got watching Natasha actually doing that bit. So thank you, Natasha. That was fantastic. <laughs> Fly me. Um, so sort of, sort of from my babbling now. <laughs> uh, so Silicon Brighton. Um, I, who's heard of Silicon Brighton here? Hands up. Okay, we need more more hands. Silicon Brighton, fantastic, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Silicon Brighton uh, were one of the saviors of async. Like during the dark years of COVID, uh, they 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 really helped support us, and and they've just been an absolute. Uh, star of an organization so so thank you to everyone from silicon brighton uh, they are they sponsored the drinks tonight and they provided the av with uh, the handsome gentleman i didn't catch your name on Cameron, thank you so much, Cameron, uh, which is brilliant. Uh, there is a fringe collaboration in May. Is this true? This is what my notes are saying. This is this is great stuff. Uh, so lots of ways to get involved. Um, did anyone from uh, Silicon Brother want to shout out uh, anything about fringe? <laughs> I also can't do the same justice to, to an intro as uh, Natasha can. Uh, no, we're partnering um, with Brighton Fringe. So our kind of whole mission is to host Brighton and Hove's tech sector, but we very much want to incorporate the creative industry into that as well. Uh, so throughout the month of May, there'll be a series of meetups all with a little bit more of a creative um, feel or elements to them as well. Um, so check out all the groups and the events that we support, come along to different ones, tell your friends about them, have more free drinks and pizza, um, and come and check out the more creative focused ones in May. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Grace. That sounds great. Um, and last ish, but not least, uh, URL box, uh, John. I've gone blind. There you are. Fantastic. Thanks very much. So, so uh, URL Box are going to sponsor our first merch in over a decade, we think it is. Um, so please, John, could you come up and say a couple of words about URL Box? Very quickly. Um, so uh, URL Box is a company I've been working with for the last few years, and I've been a customer of for five years previous to that. And it's a way for people that don't want to run headless browsers 
to um, have us do it instead. So if you want to create screenshots um, or uh, turn your HTML into images, uh, we do it for people at large scale. It's business is doing fantastically so well, in fact, that we're looking to hire an engineer. So if uh, anyone is um, interested in learning more about that, come and say hello, and I can share more. There's a, I posted a little thing on the on the Slack earlier, so you can find out more there too, but it'd be great to talk to you this evening. <laughs> so yeah, they're they're sponsoring us to to get some merchandise done for the first time in over a decade. Now, um, some of you are going to know the answer to this. How long has Async been running? There she is, fourteen years, which we think makes us potentially the longest running uh, web meetup outside of London. We're not sure in the U in the UK that is. We're, we're not sure on that, but we think it is, it, that's the case. And uh, and so your books are allowing us to, to get some merchandise printed up, including some t-shirts. So if you would like a t-shirt from what I consider to be one of the best web development meetups in the UK, <laughs> then drop into the Slack channel, which you can find from the, from the web website, asyncjs.com and and drop a little emoji. I think Jan's posted something there. So, so yeah. Aside from that, we'll be giving them away at events in the future as well. So, but, but yeah, you're all here tonight. You you get the opportunity. So yes, brilliant. Thank you so much, John, and URL box. And and yeah, I mean, it sounds like a wonderful company to to work for as well. So so get in touch. Are you going to stay around afterwards as well, John? So yeah, go get in touch with John, Susanna. Do, do I have any advice for people struggling to contain their advice for, for the D-shirt? Um, <laughs> no, I don't think I do, actually. Like, just 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 yell squee periodically. That, I think that's probably the best advice I can give. Anyway, God, that was a long preamble. I'm really sorry. Uh, I am really looking forward to, to Ollie's talk. And so I'm going to shut up and I'm going to hand it over to, to the wonderful Ollie Chadwick. He's going to tell us why we should be throwing away our JavaScript. Please, huge round of applause. Uh, thank you, Ali. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Ollie. Uh, this is a talk about why I think maybe you could throw away some of your JavaScript. Um, we'll see. Uh, can I get a show of hands from people who write any JavaScript at all? OK. And who uses it? Keep your hands up if you use it as your main uh, language that you write in. Uh, interesting. OK, so that's interesting. So most people write some JavaScript, but most people probably um, it's not their primary language. Right, what am I going to talk about? Um, the basic idea of the talk is I'm trying to work out what a front, what front end framework I should use, if any, how I should build a front end. Uh, and I've been thinking about this since uh, last year when I kind of went out on my own as a full stack developer. Um, so I thought uh, I would talk about this because uh, it's something I've been looking into. So the, the bits of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about who I am and, and why I'm here tonight and what I want to talk about. Uh, I'm going to go through the history of web development, which is very ambitious. <laughs> I put way too much into this talk, but we'll see how it goes. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, yeah my career and how uh, like I have the JavaScript that I've written, the JavaScript that I've not written, um, and where what I've kind of arrived at in terms of what I do at the moment. And then I want to talk a little bit about this is the kind of um, meat of the talk is could we be doing things differently? Are there different approaches um, from the kind of predominant web development paradigm that we find ourselves with? Then I'm going to do some tech demos, which are all going to go wrong, uh, and then I'm going to arrive at some profound conclusions. Okay, that's the, that's the plan. Part one. So who am I? So um, yeah, I'm, I work at a very small startup, which is me and one other guy I have for about six months or so called rtu.homes. Um, I've only been a web developer since 2019, so the history I have, I'm looking back into the past. I didn't live any of this stuff, even though I'm almost 40. I wasn't around 20 years ago, uh, and I live in Brighton. There's some real, <laughs> <laughs> you know, take a, a lot of this with a big old pinch of salt, right? So as I said, I haven't been a web developer super long. I've never been a front-end developer, and I'll kind of talk a little bit about that. And you know, the modern JavaScript ecosystem is a little bit alien to me. So uh, although I'm going to criticize it, I don't really know what I'm talking about. But I have done some reading for this talk. So I mean, 
So uh, this is G this is this, this is what I don't want this talk to be like. So here I am coming into async and I'm criticizing JavaScript. This is JavaScript meetup. I don't want to be Jesus throwing the money lenders out of the temple like this. Okay, <laughs> it's not what I want. I want to be more like this small naive boy just asking questions of the modern JavaScript ecosystem. Right. I'm just, I'm just asking questions, people. So, you know, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, you know? Um, but I'm just asking questions. There's a just asking questions meme. So, uh, let's go for the uh, ill-informed overview of web development. So, the web started in the 1990s. There's quite a lot of uh, AI-generated images in this. You can spot the deliberate mistakes of people using uh, smartphones in the 90s, but they're not actually smartphones. They look a little bit like smartphones. Um, web pages look like this. Very boring. And this is, this is going to be the sort of framework that I use for this history, which is the uh, relative status of HTML and JavaScript over the last um, 30 years almost. Uh, so in 1995, HTML was very high status. Everyone thought it was fantastic. It was the hot, new, exciting thing. JavaScript was a silly little toy language that nobody liked that was created in two weeks. And nobody thought it would ever amount to anything. Uh, both these things happened in 1995, so it's kind of where our story begins. And this is how web applications worked, such as they were. We had uh, the server, and we had the client, which obviously wasn't a laptop. You've got to imagine a slightly less modern laptop there. Uh, and the computer just sent an HTML document to the client. Maybe there would have been a little bit of dynamic um, preparation of that HTML on the server, but that was it was very simple how it worked. This led to static websites, which were not very interactive, not very exciting. Then we go into the noughties. Um, take a moment to appreciate what life looked like in the noughties. <laughs> Slightly different. Um, websites look like this. A little bit more exciting. And then I guess like 2005 is quite a pivotal year for all this stuff. So Google Maps was released. And it kind of gave people, for the first time, this view of JavaScript being used to create like an application, like an app-like experience, which people didn't really think was possible in the browser. This article was published, which I vaguely heard about before, uh, talking about Ajax for the first time, asynchronous JavaScript and XML, because people thought that the payload that was returned from the server would be XML rather than JSON, but everyone you know, quickly started using JSON instead. So it should be called AJAJ, really, but it doesn't sound as good. Um, and then jQuery was released in 2006. Uh, Darren here has a jQuery t-shirt, which he's wore uh, especially for the talk, which is uh, it's very supportive of him. Thank you. Um, which uh, a lot, there was a lot of cross-browser inconsistency with JavaScript. So jQuery made it a lot easier to write JavaScript. And also a lot of the sort of modern features that we rely on didn't exist. So we kind of moved into this Ajax world using jQuery. Stuff was still server-side rendered, mainly, uh, and sent over. But along with the HTML, you get a little bit of JavaScript as well. And that JavaScript does a few little things, and it will query the server asynchronously to get a little bit of JSON, which it will then use to amend the DOM. So a little, some little tweaks of interactivity. And that's, that's jQuery sort of fiddling around with the DOM a little bit there, which is what, which is what happened in the noughties. And this is the sort of code that we would get. Um, so you've got a function, which is presumably fetching some weather data from your server. Um, and then you're finding your DOM node on the page. And then you're manually saying, right, this is what the HTML should be. It should have this result shoved in the middle of it. Um, so a little bit messy. Uh, and this is the term that people use to describe this kind of unstructured JavaScript code, which is jQuery soup. And uh, as I'll mention when I talk about my career, I, I have worked with older code bases, and I have sort of come across this. Um, yeah, it's hard to tell what's doing what where, and the sort of uh, application logic and the, the DOM logic is all sort of mixed up. And it, it doesn't, it's not always a super fun time, unfortunately. So then we enter into the teenies. We actually have smartphones now. Hooray. What are you pointing there at? I don't recognize that guy. <laughs> <laughs> a web developer. Um, websites look like this. Uh, and then, OK, so now we're getting into the, the land, finally, of like single page applications and structured JavaScript and front end frameworks. So Angular and Backbone were kind of the first of those, um, released in 2010. And then in 2013, React was released. So now, 
JavaScript's the, the hit thing. HTML's looking a bit on the sad side. It's gone down below JavaScript in our, in our status column. Now, the way we make websites, we don't use any HTML at all. I mean, maybe we send, I guess we send just like a single HTML with like a, a div in it, but that's just because we have to. We don't want to, right? We send a bucket load of JavaScript over. It takes ages to download now. And then the computer actually builds the HTML itself using that JavaScript and then gets further JSON to amend what it's already built. And this is the kind of world of the team, teenies. And this is how that works. So React's got its own little model, in-memory model of what the DOM looks like, which it keeps track of. And if it spots anything different on the actual DOM, um, then it will blow that away and create a new DOM element. And everyone's happy, and it's good. And this is what our, our weather app looks like now. So it's a bit more structured, um, and we're using JSX here. So we're mixing together our HTML. Our HTML is now in our JavaScript. There are problems with this approach as well, though. Um, it's complex, so it means you basically need to have two applications. You need a front-end application, and you need a back-end application that's sending you the data. There are, as I understand it, it's not great for SEO because uh, the web crawlers are not great at executing JavaScript. And as I mentioned, there's kind of that initial loading state, which is not ideal because we're downloading a load of stuff and building it on the client. Right. We've <laughs> this is the world we live in now. If you wander outside, this is what you'll see. Um, this is, we're very much getting into things I don't know anything about now. So please do not ask any hard questions now. But we, this is the modern JavaScript world that we live in. Websites like this, very pretty, aren't they? Lovely now, the websites. Um, but actually, my graph has slightly changed here in that we're, we're suddenly seeing, I don't know if you guys agree with this, but the curve has sort of leveled off. And JavaScript's going down like a little bit. And maybe HTML's going up a little bit. So you're getting these like hybrid frameworks, as I understand it, like Next.js, which will pre-render some of your HTML on the server, which gets around some of those SEO problems, gets around some of those sort of cold start problems. Um, and React server components are a thing as well. So you're sort of mixing some of that logic um, from the front-end frameworks is now going onto the, the server. Uh, so yeah, similar to what we saw before, but maybe there's a little bit of HTML coming. OK. So that's the world. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the problems are with this approach, unfortunately, I'm sure. Uh, it's probably great. I don't know. Maybe there aren't. Um, so this is what dr has driven me to this talk, is I am a back-end developer, and I don't know how to write front-end code. And so I'm trying to work this out. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about how I have arrived at this situation. So an overview of my career to date since 2019, or how I have avoided writing NSPA. And can I carry on doing that? So. I sort of finished the boot camp sort of thing in 2019. I've previously had a long and illustrious career in the civil service, but I thought, hey, web development is where it's at. That's what I want to do. Uh, so 2019, I got spat out onto the job market. It's the first year I went to async, 2019. So it's very exciting. Um, and I worked for this company. I'm not going to mention any of the company's names because I'm slightly going to criticize their engineering practices, but it's very much not a secret if you want to go on my LinkedIn profile. Uh, so I worked for this um, company based in Brighton. It was kind of like a Wix for estate agents. Thing. It was a very old code base written in Ruby on Rails. Probably started about 2010, I think, when Ruby on Rails was the hot thing. We had like a little few little React widgets, but basically everyone was a full stack developer and we were writing server rendered code um, and we were happy. It was good. They were good, they were good times. Uh, then in 2021, I was there for a couple of years. Then I moved to this cybersecurity platform, um, which did have. Uh, a React front end, and I was recruited as a Rails developer for the API, right? We've got the two apps. We've got the front end app and the, and the back end app, and I was the back end developer. Um, but the, all the while that I was there, I was kind of questioning, do we need these two teams that don't talk to each other as much? Well, they, talk, they have to talk to each other all the time, but you can't. Nobody was working across both, both code bases, basically. And that had a real hit to how productive everyone could be. And the application really didn't use any of the single page application functionality. There were maybe some lists of users. There were drop down menus. But there was nothing that couldn't really be done server side. Um, and yeah, this approach slowed down development. So I kind of I was like, oh, do, we need, do we need these SBAs? Then last year, I thought, right, I've worked as a web developer for four years. I want to go out on my own now and do an exciting thing. I found a guy who wanted to start a company. I was like, right, I'll do it. Uh, but it's just me now, so I don't have a front-end team. So I've got to build my own front-end. How do I do that? Uh, 
we've talked about, yeah, I sort of vaguely mentioned, I looked at the, comple the additional complexity required for this sort of modern API plus front end framework. There's a lot of additional things that you need, you know? Um, and I wasn't sure that I wanted to get involved with all that stuff. Um, I saw lots of stuff on Twitter saying that, you know, the modern front end ecosystem is, um, is difficult. I love this. Everything okay, babe? You've barely touched the newest JavaScript <laughs> framework. <laughs> is this, you know, is this the world that I want to get into? I wasn't sure. I don't know. Um, and meanwhile, you know, I'm sort of like a Rails dev here. I'm very happy just to do what I'm told by the Rails community. Ruby on Rails has developed um, this slightly different approach, which is sending, rather than so similar to Ajax, but rather than requesting JSON from the server, like a structured data object that is then interpreted by a whole load of code that's sitting on the client to render our HTML, this hotwire approach, which Rails is pushing, is just you just send the HTML, right? So all your logic, all your domain logic all sits on the back end. And uh, the front end, when it needs something a little bit reactive, it needs a little bit of logic, we'll just say, what should we do? And it will just send uh, a little clump of, of HTML uh, to the front end. I was like, this seems seems good. I'll give it a go. Uh, so this, you know, it's this kind of structure, right? So we're still using Ajax, but we're just requesting like a little. We're not refreshing the whole page. We're not getting the kind of mid noughties blink when you click on a link. The whole page blinks. We're just doing a little discrete thing here. Uh, and this, so I built. This is the first app I built using this, which I demoed at Java's, uh, async in um, 2005 or so, sorry. What am I talking about? <laughs> so I demoed in May last year. Uh, there we go. For anyone who uh, was around for that. So um, yes, yeah, so this is this is my app. It is a to-do list app that is integrated with ChatGPT. It's a nice little techie thing. Ignore the ChatGPT functionality here. I just want to show you. This is all. I mean, there is some JavaScript here, which I'll talk about. But a lot of this is using this kind of like um, HTML over the wire approach. You know, so we can. We can edit this stuff in line uh, like this, you know, and none of this is triggering a page load, right? This is all HTML being set over the wire. And I was like, yeah, this seems pretty good. I can write apps like this. I don't have to get into the SPA front end ecosystem. I'm happy. Uh, what are we doing now? Oh, hang on. I've opened a new tab. Oh, dear. Uh, here we go. There we go. I think I'm. There we go. I'm back. There we go. I've got another meme. Uh, you can't see the joke on the meme. <laughs> Tragedy. Hang on. Let's get rid of this guy. Uh, hide. Hide for the joke. There we go. There we go. Let's get better. So yeah, this is what I'm wondering. I'm like, well, why? This seems like a good way of doing things. All the JavaScript. Why isn't everyone doing this? I don't know. So I started kind of looking into the history of this approach, where it comes from, and trying to understand whether this is like a weird Rails thing or this is actually the future and that everyone should do this, you know? Um, so let's rewind a little bit back to 2010, which I think is kind of that dividing point where we started heading towards this SPA world and think, like, could we have taken a different approach? So in 2011, this library called PJAX was released, which ended up being used quite a lot by GitHub, um, which was Ajax. And they used this push state uh, web history API, which was new. Are we getting some, well, that is some drilling. Boiling Someone's boiling a loud kettle. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, apparently this is the thing. I'd never heard of this before. But apparently this is like one of the first you know, uses of this, this kind of idea. So because you had push state, you could now um, do something with Ajax, but then push the fact that you changed the page onto the history of, the, of your browser. So someone's like, great, let's build this. And until quite recently, actually, this was, a, this was used by GitHub, or a variant of this was used by GitHub. Because GitHub, I guess because there's such a core part of, I don't know why, but they haven't changed their UI in a million years, and it's still server-side rendered Rails, right? So they've really faced this problem. Uh, and this has sort of been their solution for a while. Then in 2011, uh, WebSockets was published, which didn't exist when the kind of SPA path was um, initially uh, embarked upon. And as we'll see, that is you know, useful for some of, these, um, some of this stuff. 
And then in 2012, in, in the Rails side, this uh, library TurboLinks was published. And what TurboLinks did was we're still trying to get around this kind of single page, this, this page refresh blink, right? Where you click on a link and the entire page reloads. So what TurboLinks did, it's a really simple idea. So whenever you click on a link, there would be JavaScript in the library that would say, I don't actually want to follow that link. What I want to do is, this, this is just any old HTML page. Don't look too closely. There's <laughs> a lot of people trying to understand the weather app that I've created. Ignore, this is just any job, any HTML. What it would do is it would keep all this stuff on the page, but it would use Ajax just to swap out the body. So it would say, right, go to the server, get me the body, and I'll swap that out, but I'll leave all this stuff. So my huge script.js file and my huge styles.css file, I don't have to download those again. Um, and it just made wet, like Rails applications slightly snappier. Um, so that came out in 20, 2012. And then in 2018, um, Phoenix Live View was released. Um, hands up, who's heard of the Phoenix framework? Ah, not very many people. Phoenix, yeah, cool. OK, so Phoenix is this um, Elixir uh, web application framework. So it's kind of like Laravel or Rails, but for Elixir. Elixir is based on Erlang, which is this um, functional program that people who are very into programming languages are very excited about. Uh, I don't know very much. And, and Erlang in itself was developed in Sweden in the 1980s by like telecoms engineers who needed like loads and loads of multiple connections at the same time. And thus, it makes it a very good language for web applications. And you can get like um, not not millisecond, but microsecond response times, apparently, sometimes with, with Phoenix. So it's super, super fast. Um, anyway, these Phoenix guys, this is the framework developer Chris McCord. Um, he came up with this thing called Phoenix Live View, and he wrote about it. And essentially, it's the same idea, but using WebSockets. Um, this is actually slightly wrong. It doesn't use HTML. It uses JSON, but it's kind of like HTML. I don't think we need to go into it. But if anyone wants to nitpick, it's not actually, it's actually JSON. But anyway, let's pretend it's HTML. Okay. It makes it easier for my talk. Um, and WebSockets is great, right, with Elixir, right? Because a lot of web applications, it would be a significant burden to have like simultaneous connections with all your users at the same time. But if you're using Phoenix and Elixir, that's not so much of a problem. So it works really well for them. Um, and this was the demo that Chris McCord did at the time. So this is like a thermostat. And this is achieved using no JavaScript. This is all done through these kind of like WebSocket connections to the back end. So whenever you click on one of these buttons, I don't quite know what's happening here. Is this, is this cooling thing a button? I don't know. But anyway, these are definitely buttons. And they're, they're, that's clicking it up and down. Every time you do that, this is what's happening. So we've got the front end code on the right, which is um, yeah, the template that's being rendered. We've got the back end code on the left, and you'll see the anchor tags have got this PHX click attribute. And that attribute is then calling code on the server, right? So we're handle event ink for increase. So if you click on the ink button, which is the plus, you'll update what's on the front end, you'll increment the value, and then you'll send that back to the, to the front end. Um, and because Elixir and Phoenix are so fast, this is like gives you a really responsive experience. And even this, they worked out how to make Snake using this approach because you've got such fast response times from the server. So I don't know how this works, but this is this was on the, the demo that Chris McCord did in 2018 that you can have like a real time um, game running in the browser without any JavaScript, which is pretty cool. This guy. Uh, we're now moving over into the Laravel community. We're doing a full tour of um, the server-side rendered frameworks. Uh, was very excited. This is like six weeks after that previous tweet, um, and decided to produce the same sort of thing for Laravel, um, which he then published. That should have been 2019. Um, and then in 2021, um, and I should say the Laravel version didn't use WebSockets and wasn't quite as snappy and crazy and fast, um, but seemed like a, a good way of achieving similar levels of, of interactivity without requiring any, any JavaScript. And then 2021, Rails did the same thing, and they released this uh, product called Hotwire, which stands for HTML over the wire, which I think is quite a, it's quite a snappy name, right? Hotwire. 
So this is very much the exciting thing that everyone in the Rails world is talking about. This is Rails World 2023. There's all these turbo and hot wire talks. Everyone's talking about like, the resurgence of Rails. Great, brilliant. So this is very much the world I'm in. Um, but I thought in presenting this content to you guys, maybe principally JavaScript guys, you're not going to be interested in some you know, niche server rendered framework. You want to know how you could do this in JavaScript, right? So I thought I would dig into this a little bit, the sort of JavaScript approach to this. And in 2020, a library, which does a similar thing to all these things, you know, responds to um, a client side request with a snippet of HTML rather than JSON was released. And it was made by this guy who I've actually become slightly obsessed with, this guy called Carson Gross who's uh, seems like a super switched on guy, lives in Montana. Um, he is the author of HTMX. Um, and he also wrote this book last summer called Hypermedia Systems. He's also, as well as being a web developer, he's a lecturer at um, University of Montana or something. And uh, he's, yeah, he's got a real deep expertise in, uh, in the world. And he's also, as I was listening to a podcast with him today, he said, we get pretty silly on Twitter. So they get pretty silly on Twitter. So if you follow, and I recommend you do, the HTMX um, org Twitter account, it's very funny. And uh, you'll see from this recent poll that most people are just here for the memes. <laughs> Some people are running production, not very many. Um, but, and I don't know how much this, of this was just upvoting from meme fans, but uh, in the 2023 JavaScript Rising Stars, HTMX was second behind React as a rising star. Um, and he's also, this is a complete tangent, I don't know if you guys have come across grogbrain.dev. So this is the same guy, right? So grogbrain.dev, yeah, it, um, is a very funny website, and it's got some real, really interesting nuggets of wisdom. It's basically like a, a caveman's view of web development. So it's got quotes like this, Apex Protocol of Grog is complexity. Grog no able see complexity demon, but Grog sense presencing the code base. Anyway, it's very good, you should, that's complete aside, but it's the same guy, right? Um, okay, so tech demos. So I thought I would, um, just try and show you, uh, and we'll see whether this works or not, how HTMX works in a little bit more detail. So I produced this new product called To Do Ligon. It's coming, coming to a browser near you. It's made with HTMX, can't be reached. Hang on, let's start the server. Uh, here we go. Okay, so this is entirely built with HTMX. There is no JavaScript at all on the site here, but we can do. Um, some basic to-dos, very basic. You can't even complete the to-dos, you can just delete them, but it didn't take me too long to do it. Okay, so, um, so if I write here in this box, by even more ham, we'll see it pops up down there at the bottom. And the way this is working is, um, so that field there doo -doo 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 -doo, is here. So if you look at this line of code, so this is a form element. It's making a post request to that endpoint. So I'm running a Rails server. HTMX is completely backend independent, doesn't care what server you're running as long as you return the right kind of um, response. It's targeting the to-dos list element, which we'll find here. Oh, no, wait, sorry, no, no here, there we go. So it's targeting that. And what it gets back, it's gonna get back a little snippet of HTML from the server. And it's gonna put that before the end of the target here. So let's examine that again. If I open up DevTools, I should make it a little bit more obvious and put a new to do. By green eggs. By green eggs, yeah, great idea to go with the ham. Uh, hopefully this will, yeah, here we go. So we've sent that off. It's been added to the bottom here. So here is our request. And you'll see the response is just a bit of HTML. And it just gets added to the bottom there. So nice and responsive. No need for any kind of uh, JavaScript on the front end. Um, what else can we do? We can delete these elements. So if I click here, you'll see that gets deleted. If we look at the response, the request, we're sending a delete request. So this endpoint, the response is nothing. Um, and if we look at the button, for which I'll have to open up uh, this to do partial, 
Um, apologies if this is a bit too railsy, but it should just be HTML, really. Um, so this is the button we just clicked. So now we're sending a delete request to this endpoint with this ID. And we're saying, what's the target? Well, it's the closest sending up the DOM hierarchy element that is of class to do row, which is this guy. And we're going to swap the outer HTML. But because nothing is being sent back, it's going to swap it with nothing. In other words, it's going to delete it. And then separately on the server, obviously, your server logic has to delete the record from the database. This is all backed by a database, right? So that's, uh, that's the delete button. So far, so good. Um, and the other thing we can do, I think I've just got one more thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. One other thing. We can also do inline editing like this, which is pretty neat, right? Put ham on eggs like that, right? And what's happening there is we're, if we look at the element, uh, da, 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 which is this to do title here, you'll see again we're making a get request to the edit um, endpoint. The target is this element itself, and we want to swap what we get back the outer HTML. So the thing we got back was this. Um, so th this is actually a form. So this is this part where we swap it for that. So that actual form gets rendered. And then when we submit the form, it responds with this, which is just the element as it was. And you can even do, I mean, you can actually do some quite fancy things with this. You can also do, um, I haven't done it with this demo, but you can do infinite scroll using this. Um, quite a lot of things that you would think you would need JavaScript on the front end to do. Um, so, but this is search. So if I type ham, I get just my ham related to do's. And there you'll see we're making, uh, uh, we're hitting the um, get endpoint for the to do's, but we've got a search parameter in there. And what's being returned is like the full list of to do's, but only the ones that meet that search parameter. So there you go. So that's the sort of thing that you can do with HTMX. Are there any questions on that? So I appreciate that was quite a lot of code. That is fine. Yes. Transition to that's a really good question. If we Oh, sure. Right, quick recap. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a lot of slides, isn't it? It's quite a lot of slides. <laughs> I'm trying to do too much. 
Uh, cool. Okay. Um, and the interesting, I think an interesting point about um, HTMX, this guy Carson Gross, is he's actually saying this isn't like a library that he wants to exist. He thinks that this is what HTML should do natively. He wants the HTML spec to be amended to allow this kind of behavior. So I wouldn't say hx get or whatever. It would just be like an inbuilt, I don't know, just get as a possible um, attribute on your HTML element. And I think this is, you know, you can sort of see this idea of like a core functionality initially being you being um, added to with kind of plugins or scripting, uh, which then is so popular that people think, well, let's just expand the core to take account of this. So, you know, here are some examples. So jQuery had the ability to select elements using the CSS um, tags, and this eventually got added into JavaScript or the DOM API, I guess. And you know, there's some other examples of this. So you know, I can sort of see this happening. It's, you know, it's, it's not completely crazy. Um, so yeah, we've shown you what, um, I've shown you what HTMX and these kinds of libraries can do. And um, they are good, but they won't do everything. There are kind of other, you, I have found, that there are situations where you need to do a bit more, that you need some actual scripting languages. Um, so you could just use jQuery again, but people don't like that anymore. So here are some sort of modern options that I'll just talk about very briefly that people talk about in the context of HTMX and Hotwire, some sort of JavaScript options, and why they might be a little bit better. So HyperScript is like completely nuts. And this is, this is Carson Gross again. So this is his idea. Um, and this, I don't recommend you use this at all because <laughs> it's not built on JavaScript. Everyone knows JavaScript. This is just like a wild thing, but I thought I'd mention it. Um, and it is quite cool. So if anyone remembers or has heard of HyperCard, which was uh, a language used on Apple Macs in the early 90s, and was like a hypertext protocol before the internet that you could use on Apple Macs. Um, HyperCard, this is that kind of um, syntax. And he's, he's a fan of that. So he's like, let's... Let's do scripting on the web with HyperScript. But we don't want to do that. Uh, stimulus is what I use. So this is the kind of Rails option. And it's basically the same as vanilla JavaScript. But it's slightly different in that um, your stimulus files, which are called stimulus controllers, are attached to elements in your markup. And they will only work with those elements. So if you have a hello controller, that will only work and it, for the, you know, the rules that you put in place for that controller will only work on elements that have this data controller, right? So you're scoping your JavaScript to particular HTML elements. And you are then, in the markup, you're creating um, connections between your JavaScript and your, um, and your HTML. So if we click on this button, it's gonna trigger this greet method um, in the controller, and this is the kind of thing you get in the controller. Um, so I use this, it's great, it works with Rails, but also you can use it in any other project, it's just a, it's just a JavaScript library. Going slightly further is this um, framework called Alpine.js, which I've built this application with called Your Counter. It's coming, coming soon, it's an exciting new application. I was buying it. Um, here we go, so this is written in Alpine. And if I go over, yes. Oh, I did, yes. Oh, no. Do I need to go, what, story, StreamYard? Yeah, it has. Yeah, I deleted, I cleverly got confused and uh, deleted the whole window. Oh, sorry, I got it. It's, it's saved in the thing. So do you want to click some? Great, cool, thank you. Uh, cool, all right, so this is, um, where did we got to? It was here, wasn't it? So here's a toggle button, um, let's, and it toggles, not very exciting. How, let's get rid of all this to-do stuff, because this is obviously a completely different app now. Um, so this is the JavaScript using Alpine um, 
which is also the cool new thing. And this um, API in the markup here is, but is based on the view markup. I don't know if anyone, if anyone's used view components, but it's it's very similar. So like, whereas um, do you get is it is it view x? The I can't remember exactly what it was, but there's a there's a is it view data? Anyway, it's basically copied that because he's a big view fan, but he's like, can we do it without as much JavaScript? So. Here we're we're starting this uh, element and we're passing it this attribute of open, uh, and we're in, giving it an initial value of false, which you saw there. Um, and then when we click on it, we're reversing that value. So it's kind of got data binding with JavaScript that's running on the page. Um, and then this X show is like deciding whether or not to show the stuff that's within this div. And if open is true, then it will. And if open is not true, then it won't. So that's how we're toggling there. And then within that, we've got a little bit more functionality. So here, we've got another kind of Alpine component, I guess you might call it. And we're passing it this count attribute, which we're initializing at zero. And then on a click, we're going to increase that. As I understand it, this is just JavaScript running in your page. So it's just using your JavaScript memory. Um, and then at the bottom there, we're displaying that variable um, here. So there you go. Yeah. Mm. Scoped to, yes, I think it'll be scoped to that element. I think so, yeah, yeah, but it might not be. <laughs> but I think it is, I think that's kind of the point. So that's, that's much simpler, that's, that's all I've got to show you on that. Um, but I thought I would mention that because HTML is often paired with Alpine.js, uh, and there's this guy who's come up with this idea of the AHA stack. So using HTML and Alpine together, and Astro, has anyone heard of Astro? Yes. OK, so Astro, as I understand it, is like a, it uses JavaScript, and it's a modern framework, but it's trying to be a kind of purely server-side rendered um, framework, but using um, uh, JavaScript. And yeah, cool. All right, I'm nearly done, to be honest. But the one other thing I wanted to mention, talk about, and it kind of is related to what those little snippets that we just saw, particularly in Stimulus, and Alpine, which is about another Carson Gross idea. This is his website, Carson Gross, HMA, Glucality Behavior, which is, is expressing this idea, which is that if you want to make your code easy to maintain, you want to put similar things together, which is the complete opposite idea from separation of concerns, right? Which you might have heard before. So don't mix your view logic in with your application logic in with your database logic, right? But, and I don't, I've not heard a huge amount of discussion of this sort of separation concerns versus locality of behavior. But it occurs to me that actually we see this quite a lot in discussions about web development technologies, sort of where we fall on this, on this axis. So this is disorganized code. So this is what your code looks like. You're having a very bad day. All the elements are jungled together. It's often called the big ball of mud architecture. Um, it looks very good as an expressionist painting, but, uh, but not as, as code. So this is typically what I think separation concerns tells us, sort of what I was, was told, you should do. So you should separate things by their format. So you should put all your markup together in one place in a unique set of files, and you shouldn't mix them up, and your styling and your, and your application code. But I feel like increasingly, we're getting this like, code organized by function i.e. components, right? So this is basically JSX, right? When JSX came out, everyone was like, this is horrible. You're mixing your markup and your application logic. But people actually kind of liked it. And people thought it was more maintainable. And Alpine is saying, right, basically, that you put all of your JavaScript in line, essentially, in little components. And that this is how we avoid jQuery soup, right? Because the thing about jQuery is you had this thing, spooky action at a distance, right? So your JavaScript code was amending the DOM. You didn't know which JavaScript, right, was amending the DOM that was here right in front of you, the markup right in front of you. So maybe this is a good principle. And this is stuff we kind of need to think a little bit more about if you are going to drop a front end framework. Because if you are going to start you know, manually editing the DOM with, with JavaScript, you just kind of need to think a little bit more about, about how you organize that. And yeah, I, I just sort of threw together um, this slide. Uh, assessing some of these um, frameworks that we talked about in terms of where they fall on this axis. And then also, I guess, on the axis of 
I written complexity, but you could say sort of richness of UI. And the other thing to mention here is like Tailwind, which is exactly that locality of behavior. And everyone loves it, right? But it completely goes against the idea of separation of, of concerns. And that, I think, is another example of the kind of return of HTML, right? Like everything increasingly is being put in the markup, like the JavaScript and the, and the CSS styling. So right, I'm wrapping up now. Um, what are my conclusions? Um, this, <laughs> this is a very pretentious uh, slide. I read this book called The Collapse of Complex Societies, which states that it like, analyzes various societies throughout history and says that the reason that they collapsed is because they got diminishing returns to complexity. So like the Roman Empire became increasingly complex and was taxed more and actually people were really struggling as a result of this additional complexity. And then inevitably, complex societies face this kind of complexity ratchet where they get more and more complex and they try and solve their problems with more complexity and eventually they collapse, right? I'm not going to say anything, but <laughs> draw your own parallels. Um, and then I also I think like you've got to understand what kind of application you're actually building, right? Are you building Wikipedia or are you building Spotify? So if you're building this, you should never build this with HTML, with HTML or Hotwire. That would be absolutely insane. This is like a desktop app in your browser. This has to be a single page application. But going back to my experience at my last company, like I, we weren't building this, but we had a single page application. Um, similarly, if, you, if you're building something a bit like this, um, I mean, this to be honest is more simple probably, I don't know, than a lot of the stuff I've been asked to build. You know, most of the stuff I've built have kind of sat somewhere in the middle where we need like a little bit of functionality, you need to like validate things, put into forms, you need like drop down menus, you might need to like sort data in a table, you want inline editing, but you don't want a full desktop app in the browser. And I think the kind of technology I've talked about for my purposes, you know, kind of work fine. Uh, yeah, and, and the last thing I guess, yeah, is that maybe some people, I don't know, because I'm not really in that world, maybe some people think things like Laravel and Rails are like consigned to the dark ages and just aren't any good anymore. But actually, I think they work in a lot of cases, and um, they remain a good option for, for some people. There we go. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Ollie. That was a corker, I think. Uh, I think everyone would agree. Do we have any questions for Mr. Ollie Chadwick? Jake, um, I'm going to just sprint about, if that's all right. Uh, so this was actually going to lead on to a question about progressive web apps, but then you said don't use it for web apps, so I'll skip that bit. Um, <laughs> there we go. So because this relies on uh, making requests for every little thing that you might mm. be interacting with, does that mean that this isn't probably a good thing to be building for people that have a worse device or network connection or something? Yeah, um, it does rely upon having like a fairly consistent network connection, and it won't have good offline access at all. It will just completely fall over. So yeah, for those kind of situations, uh, yeah, it's not great. Do any of these tools have any any additional tools to help you do some sort of offline handling? Stuff? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't think so. I think they're kind of, you know they're probably best. I mean, I don't know what kind of situation where you absolutely, yeah, like a. Yeah, like a, I guess like a mobile app, where if you're like regularly dropping the connection, um, you lose functionality. Um, yeah, that would, that probably is, is a good use case for a sort of larger client, like a front end client. Okay, thank you. I I can't see why you couldn't just have a service worker in the middle doing that that work. Oh <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, just for the offline uh, bits. I mean, yeah, I, I think we need a. Uh, a service worker expert to tell us more about that, actually. Uh, um, any other questions? Oh, sorry, Suzanne. Um, hi. So my question is more about you and less about the tech. Is oh, that OK? Sure. Um, I was super impressed by like how you finished the boot camp in 2019 and then like did like a dev job for two years, did another dev job for two years, and now you're like a full stack developer and like, you know, a, a startup and stuff. What advice do you have for anyone who might be listening about like moving so quickly for your oh, career? Well, well, uh, it's a very kind of you to say. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I've moved super quickly. Um, uh, study hard. And yeah, I know, I don't know. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think I've learned a huge amount doing this talk, to be honest. And the way I tend to approach doing talks is I don't, I think there's two kinds of talks. 
There's ones where you know loads about a subject and people go, you should give a talk about that because you know loads about that. And then the ones where you're kind of like vaguely interested in the subject and you think, I really, I'm interested in that, so I'm going to give a talk on it because I'm interested in it. And then you have a deadline and then you frantically learn things uh, as much as possible. Um, so yeah, that, that would be one thing. I don't know. But thank you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, kudos. Uh, also, to a degree, would you say Rails? Like I've heard, I've heard yeah. that Rails can really help in terms of getting up to speed with being a web developer quickly. Definitely, yeah. I think the way Rails is kind of positioning itself is as they, they explicitly say, call it the one-man framework. So you can or woman or woman, yeah. Um, they, they explicitly say that it's designed for like small teams and you can like get um, prototypes up and running like really quickly for MVPs because so much of it is there for you. The, you know, JavaScript approaches and it's a lot more like you have to stitch things together. Rails, they're, they've got strong opinions in the ecosystem and you just use that and it can be super quick and super simple. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? I've got one for you, Ollie, just whilst everyone else sort of um, formulates questions in their mind. Uh, yeah, that, that table that you had with the, the sort of technologies that have been bought into sort of in browser, I thought mm. I thought was great. There, there was no replacement for MooTools, and I'm wondering if that's just because you feel that MooTools is the <laughs> pinnacle of... Uh... Um, God, no. Um, there is a replacement. Tools, which is like the animations API. Yeah, just the CSS animations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that wasn't like a really pointed pro tool. Fair um, enough. Yeah, yeah. Not <laughs> there, there are some, some people surprisingly still very passionate about Moo tools oh, on the okay. internet. So yeah. Um, cool. And if there, anything else? Yes. I'm just going to run around quickly. Also, your very first slide, I don't know how easy it is to get back to, but Jake spotted a, uh, a, a little yeah. indicator that it was AI generated. Yeah, let's see that. Um, I know you're a, you're a Rails developer yeah. to start with. Um, um, are any of these coming out as a favorite that you were using? I am very happy with the kind of stimulus plus hotwire approach. Mm. Uh, that works very well for me. And I, re I do really like, you know, because as I say, I have worked with like vanilla JavaScript maps before, and the way it, yeah, scopes your JavaScript, and it's just like a really neat way of organizing it. Yeah. Um, I probably, I feel like I should get better at using Hotwire, you know, that kind of HTMX-ish behavior where you don't have to rely on the JavaScript. It's kind of easier just to do stuff in JavaScript sometimes. Um, but yeah, I'm very happy with that that approach. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm finding in, with Rails 7, there's some very interesting stuff where if the model in the back end, some data changes, then you can make the screens automatically react yes and yeah, change I, themselves exactly yeah that's worth talking about actually so the stuff i presented there was all um ajax requests coming from the client but certainly in hotwire and also in phoenix live view i'm not sure about livewire which is the laravel version it's also possible to create um a web socket connection so you'll put an element on the page which will establish a web socket connection with the server and that will then listen um, for state changes on the server side and will broadcast them. So you, you could have like a dashboard um, that is being updated as the server changes, um, just with data being sent, like pushed from the server. So, you know, I don't know how much money you've got in your bank account or whatever. If that's changing regularly, it can just flash new changes, um, which is neat as well. Yeah, I'm doing some stuff where um, we're basically analyzing with a client what your house is and what stuff is around it and doing maps. But it means that they can have the screen open at the same time. And you can look at stuff and you can change stuff and it'll change their screen. Right, yeah, nice. And it's so it's more like a workspace that you're working together. So it's lots of things going on. There. Yeah, yeah. Which is stuff that you know you might think server side rendered apps wouldn't be possible at all. But the more people are you know, looking at this paradigm, actually there's sort of more flexibility and power within it than you might expect. Thanks. I'm not bored. I was just checking my my notes. Um, uh, yes, Jan. Sorry. Ah, here we go. Da, 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 da. The more you look at that that slide, by the way, the uh, the more you can see little telltale signs. It's AI generated. <laughs> it's it's quite a fun game. Cheers. Yeah, it's a really good AI gen. Um, so my question, I haven't gone far, so it's almost a, well, go and read the docs about HTMX. 
But the question is, how? Uh, so you've got a server serving something HTMX compatible. How does that server side know your markup, or, or does HTMX give you something for free that prevents you having to have your markup in two places in your code base? Uh, that is a good question. Um, how does it know your markup? I mean, I, it, I guess it is for server-side rendered apps, principally. So your markup will all be on the server right. in the first place. Yeah, and, and you, it it does need to know that. It does need to expect that request. And you'll see actually in my code, you know, I was kind of some of these files were like, you know, to do title, right? Like I wouldn't have written that. But I wrote that because I needed to, at some point, replace just the title. You know, so you need to structure your code um, accordingly. And in fact, that's kind of one of the ideas behind HTMX. And this guy Carson Gross, he says, like, in your application is inevitably, in some sense, coupled to your UI, and you should just sort of embrace that rather than just maintaining these two completely distinct things and having like the data layer uh, between it. So. Yeah, the server needs to know what's going on in your market. Definitely. That's right. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, yeah. So you can, yeah, you can definitely set your um, controllers up so they will respond differently depending on whether it is a, an HTML request or not. That's a good, really good point. Dave. Uh, more of a curiosity. Uh, why no mention of Intercooler, which was the predecessor for HMX? Well, it was only, I only had 90 slides, so. Uh, <laughs> um, and I thought I talked about Carson Gross enough. But uh, yeah, before he released uh, HTMX in 2020, there was a similar library that preceded that called Intercooler, which I think was released like 2013 or something. HTMX was that stripped down smaller and with the jQuery plugin removed. Um, yeah, and, and the, so HTML has been around since 2020, but it's really taken off in like the last six months when some like YouTube influencers have noticed it and started talking about it. And then um, this, this is why I picked up it. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm just, you know, influenced, easily influenced. The, the Promagian, Promagian, how yeah. do you pronounce it? Yeah, yeah but yeah. He's, he's big in it, isn't he? Um, brilliant, unless anyone else has got anything burning. Um, yes, Susanna. Burning. Perfect. Um, what was your AI prompt, and did the, did you specify how big the waste paper basket had to be? <laughs> no, that's a really good question. I think it was it was really specific. It was like, give me a picture of a software developer who's considering whether or not to throw away all his JavaScript. Uh, but he looks funny. like you. How did that happen? I know. Yeah. But yeah. Someone else mentioned that. Did I you think... ask it to check the space? Because uh, yeah, <laughs> you've, yeah, you, you've got a bit of an error there. They're very bad at spelling, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. This is uh, ChatGPT. Yeah. Also, make sure that all the scissors are only half scissors. Yeah. <laughs> that's a new kind of scissor you can get. Yeah, exactly. It's very, very, scissors. very efficient. <laughs> Almost called a knife. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, this is a whole new game. Like we should have this in the um, in the Christmas quiz next year. Okay. So thank you, Ollie. Um, I'm going to I'm going to sort of close the close the questions now. But you, are you going to come for a drink afterwards? Sure. Yeah. Fantastic. So so any other questions? Please come along for that. Um, hi, Steve. Sorry, I just saw, saw you. Um, so closing wrap up comments. The next event is going to be Thursday, March the seventh. First Thursday of the month is the usual. We will announce uh, ahead of time. If not, as uh, as already uh, noted, it is the fourteenth birthday for async for show and tell, which which also makes it the fourteenth birthday of Node.js more or less because that was the first talk. So there you go. Uh, please please come along and join the async Slack for for updates and general fun merriment and the possibility of getting your your hands on one of our t-shirts as well um and follow us on twitter or and sign up on meetup as well to get notified we have got javascript brighton run by the wonderful andy friend over there that runs in between so uh, so two weeks after async so the next one for us is going to be thursday 15th february is that right so brilliant um don't forget to let us know about the t-shirts as well uh, as uh, as jan said and 
that's it. I think we're we're off to go for for a drink in Unbard, which if you don't know, go down there first right, and then you'll see it on the corner. Basically, um, I want to say firstly a, a huge th thanks to to Cameron for dealing with some technical upsets very very smoothly. Also, Ollie, you champ for for, for handling those in the middle of your talk as well. Yeah, that was an absolutely brilliant speech. I think we can all agree. So huge round of applause for Ollie. The problem is you've you've kind of done it now. Now I'm going to be hustling you for more speeches every time I see you because yeah, because it was so good. Very brilliant. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. And uh, do we need to do any housekeeping, uh, Natasha? For do we like recycling, etc.? Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Natasha. So yeah, big thanks to Runway East again. Big thanks to Silicon Brighton. Big thanks to John URL Box for sponsoring. And uh, of course, thanks to coming. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. But a huge thanks for Ollie. Big round of applause and see you there. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 those slides.